evening. Good evening. It's, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the seventh edition of the Croc Lecture, and it gets better every year from what I'm, what I, what I'm told. We've got a really a fantastic uh, uh, lecturer today. Uh, I'd like to welcome Professor McCall, head of the medical school, who will say a few words uh, and, and introduce our, our main speaker, Jamie Craig, in just a few, in just a few minutes. Um, tonight, as I said, is the seventh Croc Lecture, and Jamie will be talking about techno tools to predict and, to predict and prevent glaucoma blindness. A um, few order of proceedings, as I mentioned, Jeff will introduce uh, our, our main speaker. Uh, we'll then hear from Jamie's uh, lecture, and at the end of the lecture, uh, Jackie Croc, and I'd like to welcome the whole Croc family. We've got a great turnout again this year, and we very much thank them for, for, for their ongoing uh, support. A few housekeeping issues that I've been asked to, to mention. Uh, the bathroom location is back out of the foyer and up in the far right-hand corner. Uh, that way, that way. That way. And uh, in case of an emergency, the exits are located at the, both the left and the right, and, and our cabin crew will be happy to look after you uh, in the event of an emergency. So, so with that, I'd like to introduce Jeff to come and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Jonathan, and it's a great pleasure to be here um, in my first year as the head of the Melbourne Medical School to, uh, to introduce this important lecture. Uh, I'll, I'll begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this university stands, the, Wur the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and, and present. Now, I knew Gerard Kroc. Uh, I was a medical student at the Austin Repatriation Medical School, and I was just saying um, before, uh, I remember being taught by him in the ophthalmology clinic at the Repat Hospital. Uh, as many of you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about medical student teaching over the last few years and had a lot to do with the development of the new MD program. But what I was very aware of from my, um, my previous experience in running a clinical school and others is, is that particular individuals have extraordinary influence on you in the future. You remember a handful of people as you walk your way through your journey, journey as, a, as a medical student. Now, Jared was one of those people. I actually didn't have very many contacts. I can't remember how many. It, would have, it might have been three or four meetings. But uh, he was a man who was passionate about ensuring that um, each medical student, and it was very personal, it was, and, but you know, in, a, in a kind of really educationally efficient way, got a chance to think about, um, about eye disease, think about um, the skills required to assess eye disease, um, and, uh, and, uh, and, but also about the, the, craft, the craft of medicine. I remembered the way he managed the patients at the same time as he managed a couple of medical students in a room that was too small and had no oxygen. Uh, which is, you know, that was the repat duck boards. So, um, so, so, so on that personal note, you know, clearly this, this, this lecture and, uh, is an important one which does commemorate his, his, his legacy. And, and uh, I'll read you a little bit of the, the history of his contribution because that's the personal anecdote. But he was appointed um, by the University of Melbourne in 1963 and he served as the head of the University of Melbourne's Department of Ophthalmology until 1988. Uh, his successor, Hugh Taylor, who's here as well, uh, um, later founded the Centre for Eye Research Australia uh, as a, a spin-off of the department's research activities. Gerard, uh, as I've already mentioned, was an outstanding teacher, but he was an outstanding clinician, an academic, a leader, <coughs> a, a, an, an influencer, somebody who was able to influence an agenda, a pioneer in eye research and microsurgery. He was an honorary governor and a great supporter of CIRA until his death in 2007. Uh, and CIRA was established, uh, has established a, a research fellowship named after Gerard to keep his memory alive um, for the next generations. And obviously this public lecture is also an important part of keeping his memory alive. But as I've said, his memory will be alive in those that he influenced his patients, um, those that he taught both at an undergraduate and a graduate le le um, level. Um, I acknowledge the, the Croc family here as well, which is fantastic to, to um, have you along. So for this 2015 um, uh, Jared Croc oration, um, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce Jamie Craig. 
uh, and uh, Jamie is an ophthalmologist who specialises in glaucoma. And we've had a, an interesting discussion about familial glaucoma, something that um, I know a little bit about from my family history, but also uh, medical retinal disease. Um, I'm a rheumatologist, so I spend lots of time also thinking about that as well. His research has looked at the genetic causes of eye disease and uh, what makes people more susceptible to eye disease um, in the community. Uh, Jamie uh, set up a national registry for advanced glaucoma patient and, and, and is using that to identify common genes associated with the disease. His position at the moment is that of Professor of Ophthalmology at Flinders University and also a consultant ophthalmologist uh, at Flinders Medical Centre. And I think in that epitomises again in a very important category of practitioners, which I think Jared Prock was exactly that. He was the clinician researcher. So I'd like to uh, invite Jamie uh, Craig to present his lecture entitled Techno Tools to Predict and Prevent Glaucoma Blindness. Jamie. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for those kind words. And um, I, I'd like to thank uh, Jonathan for inviting me. And um, uh, I, I'd particularly like to thank um, the Croc family, who I've just met and um, have had a very nice and interesting chat with them about um, um, you know, how well the family has done. And the, the, I've just met one of the grandchildren is in fourth year medicine um, and is possibly interested in doing ophthalmology. So I, I think that would be a, a wonderful thing. <laughs> Encouragement. So um, look, I actually love this portrait. It's, um, it it's, sits up in the, in the CIRA offices and uh, I think it really epitomises a number of characteristics of Professor Jared Crock. I think if you look at that, you can see that the determination there and the enthusiasm um, which you know he was legendary for uh, in, in encouraging people in ophthalmology and re and research and and Jonathan's been telling me today how even in retirement he was so supportive about helping to to get things established around the university and the department of ophthalmology in particular. So um, you know we've already heard a lot about the the, the contributions um, that Jared's made, but the reason I chose the title for the talk that I did was because. Jared was a great innovator, and if you look down the bottom here at the inventor category, you know it's quite a remarkable achievement to invent one piece of equipment or one technique, let alone several. And there wouldn't be a single trainee who's been through the Eye and Ear Hospital, you know, who hasn't proudly worn that binocular indirect ophthalmoscope. That was a revolutionary, you know, me method of examining the eye and keeping the hands free to do retinal surgery um, and, and examination. So. Um, Jared obviously made an amazing contribution, and, and I think if you look at um, everything about that and, and the list of achievements, setting up that first academic department is something that is just you, you can you, you just cannot possibly overestimate how many people that's influenced. People like myself who have trained there, and just to have gone through a place that has that aura about it, and and you know with Jared in particular, I think. You knew that everybody had just an immense respect for the man, and um, I, I, I'm greatly honoured to be invited to, to give the talk um, and um, to, to, I guess, share some of our own innovations. And I, and I think that the, the reason that I wanted to talk about um, innovative methods and techniques in, in ophthalmology was largely because of the, of the great legacy left by um, Jerry Prock. So I've got one more anecdote really about it, and you've heard that we run a national registry of patients with severe glaucoma, and I share a patient, a patient with Jared Crock, so Mrs J.E., and she's in her 60s now, and um, I see her every four months, and she has Stickler syndrome, which causes a, a great predisposition for retinal detachment. And even now, a patient presenting with retinal detachments with this condition is extremely difficult to fix. And every time I see her, she tells me with just absolute awe how she was sent to Melbourne and Jared Crock operated on her 40 years ago and she was in hospital for weeks and weeks and eventually came through this with, you know, uh, had cataract operation, the retina was attached, she's got terrible glaucoma associated with the Stickler syndrome as well, but to this day she still sees 6 on 7.5 and she's brought up a family, and you can just, you, again, you can't overestimate 
the, the tremendous contribution that that one procedure and that innovation that was dealing with the early days of patrectomy and almost impossible surgeries has meant to that woman and her family. So I thought that was just a, an interesting example of, of where the shared care just goes on and on and on. And even though he may have fixed many patients, that one patient will never ever forget what he's done for her to, to keep the, her, the vision that she's got. So another point about that, she was the 74th patient that we recruited into this national registry. There's now 2,000 patients. And I put up there, the referrer came from Alex Hewitt, who was a PhD student with me at the time when we established this methodology and started this project. So again, as a person who's now back in Melbourne, and there's a great sharing of, of I guess, the tradition of research and innovation across the country. In this particular patient, there were four family members also affected with glaucoma. And that is a common thing because about half the patients with glaucoma have a close family relative that's affected. There are plenty that don't, but we believe it is a very, very strongly genetically determined disease. And that's you know, part of what I'm going to talk about. This is the patient, um, Mrs Edwards there, and she's functioning on a very, very small amount of vision with 6 on 7.5. There's no vision in the other eye, but she's been stable for a long time. That's an important point because even though it seems that a large amount of vision's been lost, she's actually doing very well. And if that last little bit of vision goes, then there's a tremendous decline in all the sort of aspects of daily living and, and independence. So you would think with all these techno tools and new, new methods that we've got to diagnose and treat disease that we wouldn't see patients actually end up like that anymore. But just two weeks ago, I saw this patient presented and I've operated on them just a week ago. And unfortunately, he presented with what ended up being completely advanced end-stage glaucoma that had been diagnosed as cataract. So there was no feeling of any urgency in the case and he was you know, unaware of how to get into the system. A number of months went by and by the time he arrived, his optic nerve is really completely damaged in one eye with very almost no visual potential and the other eye we've had a big struggle to actually operate on that and we will get vision for him but it may not even be as good as the patient that I showed. Now, this sort of thing shouldn't occur because the methodology is out there that we should have easily been able to have that situation diagnosed and fast-tracked into the system, but it didn't happen. So when we see patients like that with glaucoma, it's a tragedy, really, because it was completely preventable. Had he been worked on a bit earlier, he would have had complete vision. And these patients, luckily now, are fewer in between, um, but they ask these sort of questions. What is glaucoma? Why did it happen to me? Big genetic component. Could anything have been done to prevent it? Yes, it definitely could have. Why didn't anyone warn me? And the facts are that a lot of people don't know what glaucoma even is. Half the patients in the population with it, and this is work from Hugh Taylor's VIP study here in Melbourne, are undiagnosed, and clearly that still remains the case. And many of these people have even been examined, and it still wasn't diagnosed. So there is a certain lack of awareness, and things could be done a lot better with this disease. However, screening is difficult. It's difficult to find a cost-effective way to screen the whole population. But then imagine telling that to that patient who comes in who's lost their vision and it could have been preventable. You go, oh, well, screening doesn't exist because uh, it's not cost-effective. But for that patient, clearly that would have been a far better thing to, to have actually, you know, to, to do. So we're going to talk a lot about, I suppose, the way in which we think that we can do things better. And I'm going to cover about three different areas. I believe that if you want to learn about glaucoma blindness, that you should go straight to the worst patients affected and you should study them in great detail and a lot of them. If you come down to the lower levels of glaucoma, you'll find many more patients and the diagnosis becomes less and less certain. So it's a little bit harder to know often actually what you're even dealing with. That's why we set up the registry you know, uh, methodology. And we said, look, we're going to recruit people who are about in the worst 10% of glaucoma cases in the population in terms of vision loss, at least in one eye. These are some facts about glaucoma in the world, and it affects you know, 60 to 80 million people. In the developing world, there are far worse examples of the things that I've just talked about. People commonly turn up completely blind in one eye and almost blind in the other eye. And you know, the, the treatment is difficult to implement in, in that environment but I'm mainly going to focus on you know, what we see in, in Australia and the Western world today. So this would be someone with 
moderately severe glaucoma damage with some loss around the central vision, some loss of peripheral vision. When you start getting into the stage, as the patient I indicated that Professor Crock had looked after, you may be running off just one tiny little island of central vision and a little bit of temporal vision. And that actually is enough to function reasonably, but if you lose that central bit, there comes a loss of independence, a great tendency to falls, and it's very expensive to actually care for people. And with an ageing population, as I'll allude to in a minute, you'll realise that any gains that we're making in treatment and diagnosis are also being eroded by people living for you know, much greater uh, life expectancy. So this summarises, I suppose, the way in which we went about studying what we did. We know that there's a group of patients who have definite glaucoma with some vision loss, and then we have a whole lot of patients that have borderline features on their optic nerve where we're not even sure if they're going to get it or not. And then we have this small hardcore group that actually have lost a huge amount of vision. So we said we'll just draw a line there, made some tight definitions and we're going to study that group in great detail. It takes time to do it but we set that up with very strict definitions and we set up a, like a biobank where we would take patients in if we could get a blood sample and all the clinical details relevant to their, their care. I'm mainly going to talk about open angle glaucoma. We've done a lot of work in developmental and congenital glaucoma which are also very tragic diseases but open angle glaucoma is definitely the commonest. This outlines our sort of de definitions and, and our, our sort of rigorous way in which we actually defined exactly what we wanted to include and obviously you know we've published along the way the type of methodology that we've used and because we're interested in genetic predisposition we have um, published you know some significant papers outlining some of the main risk factors for glaucoma. Just summarising I suppose lessons that I've learned in conducting this registry and we actually you know, do things like we ask questionnaires of patients, say every year they'll be asked some questions about why they think they developed this problem, environmental risk factors and things like that. And these are the four main things. One is when they turn up like the gentleman I said and already almost all the vision is gone. That is a problem of diagnosis. It should have been diagnosed earlier. There are some patients who actually are, are diagnosed appropriately and treated but they become lost to follow up and that you know, is a difficult issue because there's a certain amount of responsibility that patients have to take and there's also um, systems by which we could do better in callback and I'll come to that with some of the genetic work that we're doing. And there's another group of patients who progress despite treatment and they actually get worse despite having fairly appropriate treatment but in some of these cases they're undertreated, they're not able to access surgery when they needed it. Um, and there's other reasons why doctors may not recognise the fact that they were getting worse when in fact they were getting worse. And there are some patients that the biology is just determining that their optic nerve is dying off much quicker. And this is a very interesting group genetically and for the research that we're going to talk about. And then there's a fourth group where there's a lot of comorbidities, secondary glaucomas, a little bit like Jared Crock's patient where they've had many operations, retinal surgery, lens surgery, and these are more difficult cases to cure and fix. I won't go into that too much. It's good to study glaucoma. It's a very, very complex disease, so you can never, ever feel that you're really quite on top of everything. But, you know, glaucoma is an optic neuropathy where the fibres that actually trap from the retinal ganglion cells in the retina to the brain gradually die off, and one of the big risk factors for that is having elevated eye pressure. But there is also a group of about 30% of cases where the eye pressure is not high. And you know, both of those issues are very important. But also there's things like the um, compliance of the sclera, the outer coat, the thickness of the cornea. There's many, many factors that play into it. And I'll, I'll show some of that data uh, as we move through the talk. If we look at the advantages of having a disease registry, we can start to actually add up, well, what are the main players in blindness in our country? And that data often isn't there um, until you actually do something like this. So we can say that in our population, <coughs> open angle glaucoma is by far the, the commonest cause. In Asia, it's the flip. The angle closure patients are more common than open angle glaucoma patients. There's a secondary glaucoma called pseudoexfoliation syndrome, and that accounts for about 6% of cases. And that's perhaps a little more than what we, I might have thought when we started the the project and I won't really talk much more about those secondary glaucomas. 
when we weigh up how it is to prevent people getting into these bad situations, one thing you can't do is think that you'll throw treatment at every single patient that looks like this, because we don't know that that actually is glaucoma or it's going to become glaucoma. So we have to factor in the risks of treatment, surgeries, medication, the costs of those things, and the likelihood of people actually progressing through this pathway. And that's a lot of what I really want to cover in terms of risk profiling for patients and understanding those things. So in terms of background in the early points, about 10 per cent of cases in our population are at the severe end of the spectrum. The prevalence of the disease is around 3 per cent at 65, but rises to 10 per cent at age 90. And remember that a lot of people who have the disease don't know that they've got it. Now, in terms of the disease burden, I'm certain we're doing a lot better in care and diagnosis, and we're not seeing as many of those advanced presentations. But what we are seeing is so many more patients living into the 90s who formerly would have died with some vision and now they're reaching a stage where they're just going off the end of that cliff around the age of 90. Now, this is something that we would have never done, was do a lot of glaucoma surgery in people in their 90s. In the last year or two, I've had to do that a number of times. These are sisters who were completely independent and, you know, driving and you know, really functioning at a very, very high level, both in their 90s, both with glaucoma that was becoming uncontrollable. The pressure was way too high and nothing would bring it down. So I've had to operate on both those patients. And it, it does sort of highlight the difficulties of the problem in that one of them is still going perfectly well and strong and the other one, three or four months later, died of an unrelated cause. So you have to sit there and weigh up, did you make their life more difficult whilst you're actually intervening for something that may not have blinded her, whereas the other one might live to 102. And this is becoming more and more of a problem for us, and any other advances we make are going to have to be finding a way to deal with the problem of people losing vision late in life, because it actually threatens their independence completely at that point, even if they have nothing else wrong with them. So the techno tools that I want to cover during the talk are one, the causes of glaucoma blindness and the, the, the advances we've made to actually understand what they are. I'm going to talk about imaging the retina and Jared himself actually designed a stereo disc camera and that is you know, really in a sense an early form of glaucoma imaging of the optic nerve. We've now got some really quite remarkable data coming through about how effective this can be to show disease progression well before vision is lost. And I want to end by talking about, I guess, some of the exciting but blue sky potential for different types of treatments and cures so that we're not locked into the old paradigms, which are effective of lowering intraocular pressure, but there are some patients who obviously need more and different ways of dealing with the problem. So we've said that the optic nerve dies off in a characteristic way with cupping and vision is lost, often in the periphery first, but also centrally with, at the end stages, just a tiny window of vision often remaining. Now, this is what's called the glaucoma timeline, and we previously got excited about patients, I suppose, who are losing vision on visual field testing, and we were always told that the disease was happening way before that, and you could lose about half your optic nerve fibres and not lose any visual field. And I suppose this is an area I've changed greatly in my thinking in the last three years with the progressive study that I'm doing, because I guess I've started to realise that patients that are in these earlier stages, if they're moving fast, they are actually at very high risk of ending up like this. Whereas I think a lot of us tended to think, well, if you haven't lost any vision yet, you know, perhaps this disease is of, not of high significance in that person. And so there's a real debate about whether to observe or treat patients sort of sitting around these mid-stages. And I think we can contribute a lot to that debate through studies that we're doing. Now, this summarises, I guess, in a fairly... Um, um, sort of dry way, the progress that's been made to understand the genetics in the last sort of 12 to 15 years. If we went back before that time, we knew virtually nothing about the causes of glaucoma. This is a way of actually projecting which genes cause the disease by small effect, in which case you may need quite a few different contributing factors and which cause disease in a very large effect. So these three genes I'll speak about, optineurin, TBK1 and myosin, if you have a single bad variant in that gene, that's enough to cause very bad disease for you, full stop. If you don't, 
you may have a whole range of small risk alleles that we've discovered quite a few of these and additively they could lead to as big a problem as the large effect size. What we don't know is the ones where we don't have the answer, whether there are more of these to discover. We know that there are a lot more of these that we are discovering currently and there will also be some genes and variants that are in between. They're of intermediate effect size. So we've learned a lot and the best guess is, is that about half the disease is probably due to these small variants and we have about 5 to 10 per cent currently explained around these variants and that there's a debate about where the rest of it is and that will become clear in the next sort of three to five years depending on you know, funding and other things for these projects. So I guess the main point about God and having to change the genetic code is that we're nowhere near having unravelled it to the level that he's going to have to change the code. We've got plenty of uh, work to do and that's, as I said, is a good thing about working with glaucoma. So to perhaps express it in a slightly more um, uh, poetic way, I mean, I, I'd like to sort of put this analogy. If you have one of these rarer diseases, genes called TBK1, optinurin, myosilin or CYP1B1, it's like a great big gorilla. It's pretty rare, but it's enough to do an enormous amount of damage to you. If you've got these smaller allele size genes that we've discovered, you might not have too much trouble at all with one or two of them, but if you get surrounded by a whole pack of these guys, you are going to be in big trouble as well. So that's probably one way to just think through the talk. When I refer to these things, I'll say, look, that might be a gorilla or it's a chimp or, or, or a gibbon. Now, the interesting thing is, is that these are two of the gorillas. This one causes low pressure disease and this one causes high pressure disease, but the end result on the optic nerve is pretty much the same. Clinicians myself included, would look at it and go, well, you know, we might think that we could think of differences between what a high tension and a low tension patient should look like, but when you actually do the research and you put it up, they both cause a, a devastating optic neuropathy. But if you go into the genetic aspects of it and we look at the patients that we have in the registry and we look at who has these genes, the patients with these almost exclusively have pressures under 22 and these two here have huge pressure. So from a genetic standpoint, they're causing disease in a completely different way and these other cases are sort of here in between and where still the jury is out in a sense. So there's a definitely a dichotomy in the genetic causation. That helps us with the research and it helps us to think about different ways that these patients might need to be treated. So myosilin glaucoma was the first gene that was identified and it's a, definitely a gorilla. This one almost invariably will cause severe disease with very high pressure if it's not treated. But the great thing is if you treat this disease and you lower the pressure, you will almost certainly lose no vision at all. So that presents just a great opportunity for translation of research, which I'll, I'll come to. And the average for these sort of patients is to have a pressure in the 35 range, whereas normal is 15, an age of onset around 47, whereas on average it might be 60 to 70 years of age, Almost all of them have a family history that's known. You'll get a few where they're adopted or they didn't know the parents or the dad died in the war or something, but it is a strongly genetic disease. And the more severe the cases you look at, the higher the percent that it's accounted for. So we've set up gene testing for this so that if patients fit the profile, they can have the test done and that would have big implications for their family and that needs to be done in an accredited way so that they can have a proper feedback of results. Proper feedback of results and, um, <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, so that the families can be appropriately counselled by a genetic counsellor that we employ. So if you actually look at this patient, this is another one of the tragic ones that just turns up. I remember him coming in, he's a butcher, he was driving, shouldn't have been driving comes in, one eye's already gone, the other eye's half gone, and he's just astounded that he's got this disease, never heard of it in the family, didn't really know anything about it. Unexpectedly, he turns up positive for the myosilin gene, and, you know, again, uh, there are reasons why that could occur, but that is one reason he wouldn't have been checked, because he wasn't aware of a family history. Once that flows through the system, through the registry, and we can do this cascade genetic testing, one of his sons is tested and is also positive, it's got absolutely no vision loss, but his optic nerves are starting to look like they're getting damaged with early glaucoma disease. And he was also known to have high pressure that was being observed 
at the time by his optometrist. Now, the thing about that is then he was able to be uh, directed into a system of care. We were able to do the research with him and we would say to a patient like that that loss to follow-up is absolutely to be avoided at all costs because he will definitely end up like his father if the disease is not treated. And for example, laser has a finite duration of action in a couple of years, so he needs to be monitored very, very carefully every six months, let's say. Here's a second example. There's another patient that had very severe disease, was on about the third operation by the time I took over his care. He went into the registry. He was positive for that gene. He's got a number of children. One of them had actually been treated with laser for high pressure and lost the follow-up. She was a nurse and just had gotten too busy. And by having the blood tests and the gene testing, she was brought back into the system with only a small amount of vision loss and she's subsequently been able to have you know, surgery and she's stabilised. Now, when we looked through the other family members, um, we found that this is the one that came in back into the system and had the surgery. She's lost some retinal nerve fibre layer and this shows one of the sophisticated retinal tests that I'm going to talk about in part two there with a loss of ganglion cells from the macular area. And it's very, very obvious that she was starting to lose vision there, but really only a very small amount of change in the left eye. So there's the amount of vision that she'd lost and now that she's in regular follow-up, I don't expect her to lose any more vision at all. Now her siblings, there were actually two others, two other females who were positive for the disease mutation, but they hadn't been seen, they'd never been checked and they were younger and were totally unaware of any issue. They came into our Cascade genetic testing program and this would be optic disc appearances that would be considered potentially healthy. Um, eye pressure was a little bit above average but not, not enough to actually arouse any concern at all. Because she's now in this monitoring program with retinal imaging, what we saw is that on about the third or fourth test, the, the retinal nerve fibre started to decay and drop away. The pressure started to go up and she was starting to manifest disease. She started on treatment and that has now completely stabilised. So she won't lose any vision. So we've actually sort of written up and published this sort of methodology and we found that around about 4.2% of patients with very severe disease have mutations in the myosin gene. So that's around say 1 in 20 to 1 in 25. If you look in less severely affected patients, it's a lower rate, about 1.6%. So because it causes severe disease, it's actually important that these patients are actually picked up. We've evaluated the Cascade Genetic Testing Program. This is work Emmanuel's been doing now. And it's very, very clear that the patients in red are random clinical presentations with that disease. And they can sometimes be lucky and be diagnosed early without vision loss. But half of them at least have lost severe amounts of vision. And this is showing the highest pressure that most of them have had very high pressure. But the patients that we diagnosed genetically and monitored carefully, we got them on treatment before they lost vision and whilst their pressure had barely even started to go up. So we have, I think, pretty strong evidence that this actually does work and that there is a big difference in the clinical parameters between patients that turn up just randomly who have this disease if you lived in another country or a place they didn't offer this testing and the patients that we actually work with and the families that we work with who we think will do a lot better. So if you think about even what we said at the start, that just to influence this is 100 families we've been working with and they may have three to four patients per family who will be affected, it becomes a significant contribution to reduction of vision loss. So if we move to one of these other types of gene that doesn't cause high pressure, this one is the TBK1 gene. This was a young patient who was what we call a glaucoma suspect. We weren't sure whether she had disease or not. She went into this progression monitoring program that we're running. And in fact, again, we see that she's actually losing retinal nerve fibre layer way at a faster rate than what she should just by age. And in fact, at the same time, we got the gene testing result back. So it's pretty clear that these technologies can both dovetail well so that they can give us you know, some very strong additional information. Now, the problem with looking at those type of gorilla mutations is that we only know the results for about 5 to 6% of cases of an unselected severe glaucoma group. If you get down around young patients, it's a lot more than that. But the problem is, is that most of the disease, we don't 
didn't know what the cause was. So it's, it's probably the small effect size genes, and that's what our disease registry was really designed primarily to discover in the first instance. So to get a huge number of patients with very severe disease and then to do SNP comparisons, which is common genetic variation between all those cases and a whole lot of normal controls, and look for patterns of, of genetic variation that were more strongly represented in the glaucoma group. So we had a very you know, important early discovery with these two genes that were found to be you know, fairly strongly associated with this disease, and other people have since confirmed that. And then by doubling the size of our cohort because it grows organically, we found three more genes in the last 12 months. And we now have, I guess, you know, a, a collaborative exercise with American groups where we put our data together and we're you know, dramatically expanding those numbers probably every six months. So that means that when you add the effects of all those small genes up, we will be starting to have very substantial predictive capacity. It looks like around about the sort of three to five relative risk if you actually have a bad hand of those small genes. And that's what we want to look at within the um, progression study that I'm going to move on to talk about now. One of the harder things to do is to get to grips with the function. So it takes a long time to actually get these discoveries and go, gee, we don't know anything about the TMCO1 gene. We now know that it's in nucleolar location, that the other gene and this gene are involved in cell cycling, so it opens up complete new pathways to understand the disease. That will be important for um, new treatments, but it will take a lot of time. I wanted to see some translation ahead of that time, so what my concept is, is to work with the idea that if you take the huge number of patients with borderline disease, you're not sure which way they're going to go, but they do require either careful monitoring or treatment not knowing if they're going to get worse. And we want to see whether the hand of SNPs and the common risk variants that you've got will help to understand who progresses faster. And that's what this NHMRC funded project is doing. It's now in the third year of five years of follow-up and you'll see some pretty interesting data now about the way in which progression can be determined before you've lost vision. And we're starting to do the genetic crunching now because it's a prospective study and we want to be completely unbiased as to any results. We need to determine the progression rate before we actually do the analysis. So I'm going to turn to talk about imaging. And this is where we're actually trying to get into the stage before vision is lost and see if we can learn something about whether patients are getting worse and how quickly they're getting worse. So this is two patients that are in the progressive study and I won't put anyone through the, the pain of having to make a guess about which one's going to get worse. I've done it three times. In an ophthalmology conference about 20% got it right. I presented it at an optometry education session and one person got it right. And then I presented to some geneticists a couple of weeks ago and about 25% got it right. And by my reckoning, the gorilla should get 50% chance of getting it right. So one of these patients gets worse and one does not get worse. And have a think about which one you think it might be, particularly the ophthalmologist. But patient one deteriorates very rapidly over a three-year period with a very, very rapid rate of loss of retinal nerve fibre layer. And the other patient remains completely stable when we repeatedly image the nerve fibre layer. So they're completely different patients and there must be something that's determining why one is getting worse. And we need to be able to predict that either from the genetics or by doing this kind of detailed serial monitoring, which is difficult to do in a routine clinical setting. These patients are having six monthly scanning and visual field tests and they have photos annually, so we've got complete data. But I guess that I thought that maybe you know, as I said, we could observe patients a lot more readily back in these stages. But now that I've actually seen the results of this, you'll see that there are some patients that do get worse so quickly that you actually know that they're going to lose vision, even though they haven't yet started to lose vision. So this was the older form of OCT time domain, which wasn't really up to standard. But when I started doing this back in 06, 07, a patient like that lost a lot of nerve fibre layer in a short period of time because the pressure was high and then had surgery and is now completely stable. So I thought this sort of methodology would work and you can see there that rapid drop off but it couldn't actually align things properly and it wasn't sensitive enough to actually do the job. So it needed to actually be superseded by newer technology spectral domain that's got more sensitivity, it's got a better ability to overlay test after test 
and we're looking at the nerve fibre layer around the optic nerve. I'm also going to talk about the macula and the loss of tissue in the macula. So this is the sort of beautiful arcuate loss of nerve fibre layer that you can see and that shows that in that eye there is a significant defect forming there. That patient may or may not yet have lost some visual field at that point but it's clearly in a glaucoma pattern. Now there's studies that have looked at sensitivity and specificity of this for diagnosis and you can see there's a huge range in what it thinks it can do and that is because the definitions of glaucoma vary a lot and these studies can be quite hard to interpret. So I sort of go for the methodology of do it yourself and see what you think yourself. It's actually extremely sensitive for diagnosing glaucoma, particularly if there's a field defect, but specificity is, is always going to be a problem because you'll find other things that are not glaucoma, for example. So in terms of innovation, and I suppose telling you something that you may not have seen or, or heard as much about, this is macular ICT where we're actually imaging the ganglion cell layer in, in the retina. So there's very little data out there about how this would look in a serial setting over time. So what I'm going to show you hopefully is, is, is new information for a lot of people. Um, so when we actually look at this, the, the resolution in the retina there, you can actually pick out the layer that actually has the nerve fibre layer and the ganglion cell bodies and the inner nuclear layer and we can segment that on scanning so that we can actually define how thick the layer is that actually has the ganglion cell complex um, is what we're going to talk about, the nerve fibre layer and the ganglion cells themselves. And about half of the ganglion cells are in the macula area, so it's not a bad place to actually look if you're interested in glaucoma, although it wasn't done much previously. That's what a normal scan looks like. That's a thick, healthy sort of layer there, and these are sort of normative ranges, and that's how it should be. This shows that it's reproducible over time. That's a mild glaucoma patient, moderate and severe, where they've lost most of the, the ganglion cell um, tissue. And this is a myosin patient where they've actually lost a typical wedge defect. So if we see that now, we know that is almost certainly a glaucoma type pattern of loss. So what we're going to look at now is whether it's any better or worse than nerve fibre layer testing. This is one example where the nerve fibre layer comes up normal, but once you get out beside that, outside that range, you've got a clear defect and it's abnormal on the GCC. But it makes it look more sensitive, but you can find patients that go the flip way, so it's not always going to be the case. And you know, that example of the patient I've just shown has optic nerves that are very, very suspicious, but not definite for glaucoma and a normal field test. So in that case, that GCC ganglion cell test was actually more sensitive than anything else that we had out there. Hopefully that's going to come back up. Yeah. Um, so one, some of the pitfalls and fallbacks that you can run into in these things is the specificity, like I said. So one of our master's students has looked at the first 1400 eyes from the progression study and what you find is that if patients have unusual retinal problems like a staphyloma from myopia, epiretinal membrane, schisis, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong, a floater, it can make it look to an unskilled observer like there is a glaucoma pathology. So about 6% of cases you actually see that sort of problem. If you re-scan them you can eliminate it in about half of those. So it's still pretty good, you're only going to lose a few percent but they can cause confusion for people who might think well that's a glaucoma problem, I'm going to put them on treatment. We're perhaps more interested in the idea of progression and so to give examples of how this could be very, very helpful, here's a patient who's got completely normal visual fields. The pressure's high in one eye and the right eye, but at a range that we don't necessarily treat. The other eye, the left eye, is completely normal. Now, when we look on the scans, there is a little bit of nerve fibre layer defect in the right eye and perhaps something even starting up in the left eye. The right eye is clearly abnormal. The fields don't change at all over time. Um, and the, the eye with the normal pressure doesn't change at all, it's highly reproducible and there's absolutely no decay in nerve fibre layer over a four or five year period. But if we look at the eye which had the, that's the normal eye, if we look at the eye with the high pressure, you see decay and loss of nerve fibre layer and you can actually measure at five microns per year that that's going to become a very serious problem for that patient because they might have only 50 microns to play with 
and they might be 50 years of age. So that person is going to run into serious vision problems in the next, you know, probably eight to 10 years. So it's clearly better for that patient to be treated rather than observed. And these statistics on those each visit by visit show that you start running into possible problems and then definite statistical change indicating that there is a problem. And all this is occurring before there's any visual field loss at all. So at stages that we would have previously said, well, there's nothing really going on, don't worry about it. Now, if the pressure's higher, sometimes when you take steroids, your pressure can go very high. You can see that you can get enormous rate of change even before you lose vision. So that's losing rate at about 20 to 30 microns a year, still with no field loss, and that patient will be in very serious problems within a year or two. So clearly has had you know, a lot of treatment to bring that situation under control. And if we look at these other normal tension glaucoma type genes, this was a patient where when we put her into the progression study, we didn't know that she had a genetic problem. She had large nerves with a healthy looking rim, and it was unclear whether this was needing treatment or not. But over the duration of that study, the, the nerve fibre layers clearly deteriorated and this severe gorilla type mutation was found that's causing her to lose um, visual uh, or nerve fibre layer and she's now on treatment. We see other examples where we don't have the cause and this is, shows the utility of the ganglion cell testing where on six months by six months it just colours in because there's loss of tissue that's occurring. That patient was starting to lose visual field. Here's another case where, again, it's just very clear that that's increasing, but we don't have the sophisticated progression tools yet to actually plot that graphically, so that's part of the research that we're obviously doing. Here's the myosin patient with that particularly obvious defect, and let's look a little more closely at what happens. The other eye starts to develop some loss of nerve fibre layer, even though it seems that the pressure is good and there's no field loss. So we may be running into trouble there at 2.7 microns per year, statistically significant. And this actually goes to show the sister who wasn't on treatment but clearly changed, went on treatment and then stabilised. So after treatment was initiated, we're not seeing further decay in that patient. And the second sister who was younger has been absolutely fine until a few weeks ago and now we're just starting to see some borderline suggestion of change and a significant rate of nerve fibre layer loss. So it's changing the way that I think about the disease and the timing at which treatment should be initiated because I wouldn't have treated those patients otherwise. This is about as fast as you'll see a patient who had healthy discs and very high pressure going down at 24 microns a year has required surgery in both eyes because it was impossible to control the pressure any other way. And now I expect that patient to stabilise and hasn't lost any visual field. And again, you can see how dramatic this technology can be to actually pick this stuff up. Um, that's showing it in another graphical format with just huge reduction over a short space of time. And I guess in the average patient it's going to happen slower, but the proof of the principle is clearly there. This is a patient with ocular hypertension, not necessarily requiring treatment guidelines would indicate no need to treat that patient, but after it was clear that the nerve fibre layer is decaying, we've encouraged that patient to go on treatment when her preference was to remain off treatment if possible. So that's changed by management and there's just many, many examples where the way in which we're treating patients is changing based around the detailed knowledge that we've got from this type of innovative uh, monitoring process. And again, we see quite commonly that actually the disease seems to stabilise once the pressure is reduced. Now, this is the last sort of example that I'll show from that, but it covers a very, very important point. Here's a patient with established myosin glaucoma who hasn't lost much vision at all. There's a little bit of field loss in the right eye, but quite severe optic nerve damage. The left eye's got no visual field loss and has been monitored for many years and seems to be doing really well. The right eye, is actually starting to lose visual field and is probably getting into trouble. Now, this patient's an artist and is in his 50s. He's not very keen on having surgery and everything else we've done already, but I think he's getting to the point where we're probably going to have to intervene. If you look, intervene further, if you look at his nerve fibre, that eye with the field loss, he's got almost no nerve fibre left. The left eye has still got a reasonably healthy amount, or at least some. If you look at what happens to the ganglion cells, there's almost nothing left in the right and he's got a decent amount in the left. But look at the progression. The one that's getting worse on the field is not changing because it's already so bad you can't predict, the, you can't actually see the change 
Whereas the left eye, what you're seeing is that it is actually changing, even though the field isn't changing at all, and he's got very clear progression and loss of vision, so, loss of nerve fibre layer. So it shows a very important point that there's totally different time frames with these technologies. So we're used to the visual field and monitoring that way, which goes off later and then declines quickly, whereas the nerve fibre layer is dropping much more quickly very early and then flattening out, so we're not able to detect that change here. So this is just a complete sort of paradigm shift in the way we need to think about glaucoma progression, but those patients going fast here are the ones that are going to end up legally blind here, which was the whole point of what we're trying to predict so that we know who to treat aggressively and who not to. So in the old way, there were these rare patients that were doing okay and then rapidly went down. And we really don't want to see this sort of thing because once this is happening, they're already very, very far gone in the process. And sometimes it actually goes downhill very, very fast once it starts. So I think, I guess, the bottom line with all that is, is that I believe there's an enormous amount of value that can come from this the more that we learn. But you do need to do a lot of scans. I've, we're scanning six monthly in that project and they need to be good quality. It's not good enough to do it every couple of years because by the time you get four or five scans to see a difference, eight or ten years have gone by and the rapid progresses, it's already happened in the first you know, one to two years. So th there's obviously a lot of Medicare and public health issues that have to be addressed here. There's no rebate for that technology, for example, but there is for fields, but it may be far better to do that testing in an early patient than a field test, so we need to advocate for that sort of thing. This study is going to enable us to look at many other variables as well as the genetics, but the goal is to look at the common variants and look at the progression rate and try to find a good healthy correlation between those things. To give you a quick example of one other techno tool, this is something um, where um, it's an air puff tonometer, but we do a video to actually look at how the eye actually responds to an air puff. So that is actually a fairly normal situation. It looks fairly sort of um, fairly heavy duty. This patient has got a very, very thin cornea and um, is, has got quite advanced glaucoma. And just have a look at what happens exactly the same force. And that is a fairly dramatic image, isn't it? Because you see the whole eye shaking and around. And so the, the, the idea here is that what is believed is that if the eye is very compliant and floppy, it may be more at risk of actually losing vision from glaucoma. But we can now test that when in fact it's all anecdotal up until this point. So we'll take the progressing patients and the non-progressing patients and we will then see which ones actually get worse. Is there any correlation with that test or not? If there is, that's great. If there isn't, well, we debunk that theory. And that's how I think that we should be doing you know, research so that people aren't pushing lines that actually aren't, aren't correct. So the final part of the talk, which is re relatively brief, is to just, I suppose, talk about some more blue sky. So the things I've showed you are making a very big difference to how I manage patients and how we prevent visual loss and blindness already. And I hope that I've been able to illustrate that. These newer technologies, we're at the sort of point where we know it's really important to make these discoveries and to think of better ways and different ways to treat. But, you know, it takes time to actually see a translation of that into a better outcome for a patient. But we're actually looking at sequencing all the genes in the patients with advanced glaucoma. So there's exome sequencing where you sequence the coding regions and there's whole genome sequencing where you sequence everything. The issues are it's very easy to find mutations. It's harder to prove because you've got this sort of needle in a haystack phenomena. We think we've found some very important stuff already, but the statistical burden to prove it is actually very high. So I won't go too much into that but I will show an example of a pathway that we've found. We're very interested in generating retinal ganglion cells from patients with specific NTG gene mutations, and we're doing that in a collaboration with great researchers in Melbourne, which I'll come to. And um, we're interested in doing transcriptome profiling, sequencing every transcript in the different <coughs> ocular tissues in normal patients, in glaucoma tissues, and in these specifically generated ganglion cells from patients with mutations. And the, the ultimate aim of this is to be able to correct the mutations and see that you can actually reverse the effect of more <coughs> rapid ganglion cell death. And, you know, I think that is actually a very feasible and achievable goal. So just to give a quick sort of um, synopsis of some of those things, 
This is Tiger Zhao. He's a very strong PhD student of mine. He's, uh, after two years, he's mastered the analysis of exome data. And you know, we've got data there where we've sequenced a couple of hundred advanced glaucoma cases and compared them with a thousand and there's public domain databases of a hundred thousand patients so we can look at the type of genes that are mutated. And here's an example that for high pressure patients, what we've seen is that the pathway that has mutations in this collection of genes is strongly significantly associated um, with the glaucoma cases that we've done so far and that this pathway is, determined, is determining an unfolded protein response. So the way that proteins aggregate potentially in the trabecular meshwork, which we know I'll come to with myocillin, but also even for ganglion cell death in the retina and apoptosis, things like Alzheimer's disease are also implicated in these type of pathways. So this is looking very, very promising. We need the funding gods to smile on us so that we can then sequence the full sort of two to 4,000 cases that we've got, because then we'll have easily enough statistical power to nail down a whole lot more very definite genes with mutations. And this is telling us you know, that once we start to look at where those pathways lie, then we can actually make a whole lot of different sort of levels of understanding about why the disease is going wrong in the first place. And this is, I guess, following on from the SNP work, where we've already got a pretty good handle on some of those pathways. Things like apoptosis and autophagy are clearly very important. And you know, we're doing some work with Jonathan's group about mitochondrial complex one mutations and you know we think that there's potentially some signal going on there as well. This is RNA-seq analysis where we're looking at the transcripts and these are actually donor eyes that are normal and these are supposed to be laid on top of each other because he's got six replicates where he's very very carefully dissected out trabecular meshwork, optic disc, optic nerve from behind the eye and retina and we're looking at the type of transcripts that are found in their relative abundance and then we're looking at you know, very detailed statistical mapping comparing what is expressed in those locations. So if we look at things that are heavily expressed in the trabecular meshwork, the second most biased expression profile belongs to myocillin, which we already knew is a very significant and important high pressure disease gene. And it's 128 fold more expressed in meshwork than it is in the, the back of the eye tissues, although it is expressed there as well. So these other genes that are, have that profile become good candidates and it becomes important for us to be able to look at these when we're finding mutations following the exome type strategy. So there's a great deal of, I guess, potential uh, within this sort of area. And coming on to finally the stem cell type collaboration, I mean, we're very interested in the patients with the gorilla mutations that have TBK1 and optineurin because it causes a very severe normal pressure type disease. Loss of vision in young people exactly in a glaucoma pattern but without ever having high pressure. So it's typical severe cupping and these families are dominant and 100% penetrant and again patients can be affected as early as like 18 to 25 years of age although much milder and it seems to just run a slow progressive deterioration over the course of life. So this is optineurin E50K, which is a very severe mutation in that gene. And we're now starting to do predictive testing, cascade testing in these pedigrees as well to complement the work we're doing with myocillin. So here's TBK1. This is a gene that is duplicated. And so if you've got three copies instead of two, they get very severe apoptosis and loss of retinal ganglion cells. And we're working with these families now just to see, well, what does it look like at a very young age and you know, we're making, I think, some very good progress in understanding this disease better. So if you look at people in their 30s, you see they're already losing their fibre layer. It's significant, but they're only just starting to lose visual field. But again, if you actually go to these sort of families and look later in life, like 60 or 70, it's almost game over by that stage. And these patients certainly aren't driving and they're close to blindness. So this is the better seeing eye on a 10 degree field with just a little bit of vision left in a 75 year old. Quite clearly, we would like to be able to do something to help that patient or to get the young patient who's in that category and stop them from losing vision. We think that conventional treatment works, but it doesn't work completely so that they still do tend to progress despite the fact that you lower their pressure further. And the very interesting thing about these two things is that there's a very 
tight functional link between the two genes. If you have a mutation in optoneurin at that point, it avidly binds to the TBK1 protein and it locks them together. And so it, it, it is clearly a very pivotal point in understanding why ganglion cells die, and that's why we're very keen to study it. We're working very closely with Elise P. Bay here and Alex Hewitt, and we're using the genetic database of ANSRAG to, uh, to find the patients who have those mutations and then developing ganglion cells from them so that we can then study the biology. This shows that the clinical features are almost identical between those two different gene mutations. This is a previously published paper that had showed that E50K mutation in optoneurin makes that protein bind completely avidly to the TBK1 protein. And some mouse work had showed that this is a very important pathway in ganglion cell death. And that protein aggregation and insolubility is again implicated in this disease process, which is exactly what Tiger Zhao's finding from our exome data. So the common threads are coming together that actually are telling us, you know, that we are discovering some important things. Now we've got a grant that's in currently, you know, in this funding round, and it is the first time we've put it in, but we're very, thanks Alex for sending the iPhone picture through. It's, it's perhaps destroyed the, the, the harmony of, of the rest there, but anyway, we're very, very grateful for a lot of hard work that is put in by Elise, Sandy, Ray and Elena, who have diligently been able to actually get um, iPS cells and ganglion cells developed from some of our patients with E50K and the TBK1 protein. So now what we've been able to do is the same transcriptome profiling that I showed you that we did on normal tissue. And this is really the first sort of data coming through there to say that three separate lines with the optoneurin mutation have a very different profile to some controls, other ganglion cells from wild type patients. And we'll be wanting to revert that mutation back to the wild type so we can do uh, a completely isogenic control to understand what pathways are going wrong in those patients. But already we've been able to show that of the binding partners um, of optoneurin, two of them are very, very significantly <coughs> dysregulated in the, the, the retinal ganglion cells from the patient that has that disease. And so this is very preliminary data and thanks to Alex for getting it together. And we really believe that this project has got a lot of legs because if we can actually do those reversions, it does open, I suppose, the door to potentially, you know, <coughs> designing drugs to shift things and correct the pathways that are wrong, but also even to potentially correcting the mutation in vivo, because at the end of the day, you probably don't need every single cell to be actually corrected. You just need enough so that you can see. And just finally, so I guess, drawing those ideas together about where new treatments will come from, this is the myosilin situation that's been known for longer, and there is a drug that has been shown to be effective in a mouse model of that disease, and the drug, phenylbutyrate, unfolds folded proteins. So again, the same pathway that we've just been discovering is going wrong, is able to be unfolded by a drug, and you can actually cure the mouse that has the disease, potentially quite close to human trials for the myosilin patients. And even more recently, what we've seen is that at Arvo this year, the major eye conference, um, the group that actually has a transgenic mouse model for myosilin was able to do an in vivo correction of the myosilin mutation and actually reduce the eye pressure by correcting the genetic mutation in the meshwork. So we're very lucky in the eye that these tissues are accessible. The retina can easily be accessed for gene therapies and tran transfection, particularly under the macular re regions and the mesh work is very accessible and injections are given in their thousands every day across the country for other diseases. So there is great potential to actually completely reevaluate the way that some of these type of diseases could be treated with the potential for cure. But, you know, we don't know if this is going to work and we, we have to keep working away at it and keep the work going. I guess the last point is what efficiency would be needed because the criticism would be, well, you're not going to be able to correct all the cells, but if you think back to the very, very beginning of the talk and Jared Crock's patient who's functioned perfectly well for many decades and brought up a family and has only a small amount of vision, I would say she's functioning on 1% or less of her retinal ganglion cells. And she's obviously not a well-sighted person, but she manages. And if you could correct 10 to 20% of cells in those patients with those severe mutations, I think they would be perfectly compatible 
um, with good sight um, for the duration of life, no matter how long the life expectancy is. So I suppose this was a bit topical because I heard it on the radio today. We're obviously not in the business of patenting these tests or anything. We're in it because we really want the patients to do better. And you know, I think that there's enormous potential for this work to actually lead to different treatments. We're very, very keen to talk to anybody who wants to refer and, and get involved in the research. And we're very grateful for the collaborative opportunities that we've had with Melbourne in particular and all around the country, in fact. And I'd like to thank you for your attention and for being invited to be the Jared Kroc uh, lecturer for this year. Our financial support, um, just a few funding agencies that it is important to point out have funded parts of our work and the very many people, particularly today the CIRA group who have sent many patients to the ANZRAG and also the, the, the group of Elise and Alex who have been so keen to collaborate and work with us with the patients for the stem cell work. On my own group, Emmanuel has done all of the genetic counselling and cascade testing and we've got great contributions from Jude who has done all the ganglion cell work as a master's student and from Tiger Zhao that I also uh, referred to some of his exome work. So thank you very much. <coughs>